Do you want to get an A in the TOK exhibition? Well, this person did it and I'm going to show you how. Get an A in TOK. The example that we're going to look at today is the IB's official example of what a TOK exhibition that scores a 10 looks like. Now, I'm not sure if I can provide a download link to this PDF or not, so I'm not going to do it. But if you want to look at other examples that I wrote just for you, you can go down into the description of this channel, download my entire exhibition packet, which um, hacks the rubric. It um, makes an organizer that you can use, and it provides multiple examples that I wrote so that you can see other examples of um, really high scores. The only thing is um, don't plagiarize me. Like, seriously, I don't want to, you know, cause you to fail the whole diploma program. Also, you'll get caught. I'm working on a website. I'm going to put these all guys all up there. So um, just click subscribe, click my links down at the bottom, get an A. All right, let's go. So this example got an A. And because it does something weird, I think a lot of people are going to try to emulate this, but it does something weird and unique that the IB in their response to this actually said, we don't ask you to do. And that's this intro right here. And the intro is not required. It's not asked for, but this person did it. So um, while it's totally fine that you do it, I think unless you are brilliant, this introduction is actually going to hinder you because um, it's taking up words that you might want to use for development. So I would actually suggest cutting this out or cutting it way down. There's two things in here that I really like. Let me show you um, what is so good about it. Also, this is 126 words. That means that after this introduction, they only have 825 words to um, write the exhibition. That's that's crazy. So um, anyway, let me show you how this introduction works and if you want to do one, how to make it really good. So they title their um, exhibition Subtext and Connotation and these are the two keys that they're going to do. And yes, I am doing University of Washington Colors, go dogs. And they're going to be talking about subtext and connotation the whole time. So the TOK prompt I have selected is what challenges are raised by the dissemination and or communication of knowledge. This is a really good prompt. This exhibition explores this prompt by reflecting on knowledge and language. We got W OK there. Way of knowing. Ooh, that looks like Washington. And more specifically on whether subtext and connotation always create confusion rather than help us to communicate knowledge. Honestly, I would stop right here but they keep going. It's really good, but I don't think this is necessary. The language we use in our everyday lives can often be interpreted many different ways by different people, depending on their cultural background, beliefs, ideologies, affiliations, personal experiences, etc. Don't ever, come on, don't say etc. In particular, it seems that subtext and connotation can be particularly challenging as they are often only recognized by people that share some particular knowledge or experiences and it seems that they can easily be interpreted very differently by different people, which can cause confusion and hinder communication of knowledge. Okay, that's cool, it's not necessary, but the reason that it works so well is it's very specific. It doesn't just say, here's the IA prompt I'm gonna talk about, it says all three of my responses are going to take this very specific approach, which is talking about subtext and connotation creating confusion. So this is the theme that holds it all together and it does it in 126 words. It says, here's what my whole paper is about. Um, I wouldn't suggest this, but um, if you want to do it, go ahead. So the first object is a very, very pixelated Starbucks cup. Um, holiday, holiday, not Christmas cup. Come on, we got to be politically correct. We got to be woke here. So um, that's their object. And this is probably the best example of staying laser focused on an object. They, they do it better than some of my examples, honestly. This, this inspires me. You know, they've got a holiday cup. I want a Festivus pole right in the middle. That's what I want. Okay, let's read about the first paragraph, which is they're gonna introduce the object and its context. They nail it here. Let me get my yellow highlighter ready. This cup was used by Starbucks in 2017. Here's the object and the context and was controversial because some people viewed the symbol of the two hands, two hands holding hands, on the cup as a sign that Starbucks was promoting a homosexual agenda because they saw the cups as having an LGBT subtext. I don't know how holding hands is LGBT. That's that's kind of weird. However, many other people just saw the cup as spreading joy and love during the holiday season and did not think there was any particular subtext at all. So this, this introduces the object it introduces on um, the context and it connects to the theme that has already been established. This works really well. In the next paragraph, they're going to tie this all into knowledge. 
This cup is particularly interesting for this exhibition because a Starbucks spokesman said that they had intentionally designed the cup so that customers could interpret it in their own way, which suggests that they were deliberately trying to communicate in an open or vague way rather than seeing the disagreement that, might, that this might cause as being negative or a challenge. In this way, the cup highlights how confusion arising from the use of subtext can be useful or can actually even be, be used by people to intentionally provoke discussion. The cup generated a lot of media attention for the company while still allowing them to say how the cup was to be interpreted was up to their individual de customers to decide. So a TOK term, we're talking about interpretation a lot. Um, I think this is really good and how the interpretation connects with disagreement. This is really good. We're talking about the subtext. We're talking about the context. This is so teacher language here, but it's all being tied into knowledge and interpretation. The third paragraph is going to, um, not explicitly, but more implicitly tie into the question, I'm sorry, into the prompt, which is about, what is it about? The challenges that are raised when I'm communicating. So look at what the last paragraph says. This is very strong, but I wish it was tied into the prompt more. This cup also enriches the exhibition. So that's saying, hey, look at me, I'm addressing the rubric because both some members of the LGBT community and also some members of the right-wing media and public saw the cups as promoting same-sex relationships. While both of these different groups interpreted the cup this way, their reaction was very different, with one seeing this as very positive and one being very upset about it. So here again, we're talking about perspectives. Yet other people didn't see this subtext at all. So in this particular case, it wasn't only that the subtext itself was seen or understood by some groups and not others, but also that the reaction to the subtext also deferred very dramatically. So what I like about this is this is taking one step deeper than talking about the cup. So this says this cup existed, but now there are perspectives. And so we're breaking it down. This is what analysis is. You break something down and then you form conclusions. And um, they're saying because there was this agreement, what are the th one of the things I'm noticing is there was this agreement, but there's also agreement with different perspectives as to whether this thing that we both found was good or bad. Really great way to go deeper. The last thing I like about this example is they don't um, tell us an answer. They get us to explore. And I've got the best handwriting here. They get us to explore. They are not saying here's the right interpretation. They are not saying here's what the truth was. They are just saying here's what happened and here's one thing that I can think about, which is that different groups interpreted the cup in the same way, but for different reasons. Really good. Let's go to object number two. Object number two is really important because a lot of students want to use a book as their object. And this exemplar, this example, um, nails how to use a book as an object. So what's really important here is we're not talking about what the book is about. Instead, we're gonna talk about how the book communicates knowledge. The first paragraph is super simple and all it's going to do is what we want to do. We want to introduce the object and talk about the context. And um, that's what the um, organizer that I have in the description, that's what it tells you to do. Download. This object is a dictionary I use to help me translate between Chinese and English. When we think about how language is translated so that it can be communicated between people who speak different languages, should be a comma there. We can see that this poses many challenges to communication of knowledge, particularly because of the way that language uses connotation. You know, we got a keyword there, euphemisms, proverbs, and idioms that go beyond the literal meaning of the word. This is great. It's got a really long sentence there, but this is well written and it's just telling us here's what I'm going to talk about. The second paragraph is gonna instantly go deeper and start talking about culture. It's gonna start talking about history, perspective, all things that are TOK concepts. They are concepts that deal with knowledge. And so here the student is gonna tie it into the themes mentioned in the intro. Let's look at the second paragraph. The meaning and true essence behind many words and phrases is often unique to a specific language and the cultural historical understanding that comes with an intimate knowledge only a native speaker can acquire, particularly things like connotation, where language can have not only its literal translation, but can also can have secondary meanings. 
So though we don't mention the dictionary here, it's very clear that this object is talking about how the dictionary communicates, not what it's doing, which is defining two totally different things. The third paragraph is um, really pretty short. This whole response is pretty short here, but it's gonna use the phrase um, included in this exhibition, which is something that the rubric asks to do. This is really short, but it's very clear on topic and goes deep very quickly. This dictionary is therefore included in the exhibition as an example of where language and culture can really impact on communication of knowledge. That's the prompt, by the way. And on whether we can, whether we see connotation or subtext, keywords, man, they're nailing this. This is so good. At all, as those nuances might be lost in translation. I also have included this dictionary in this exhibition because of how it represents me and the challenges around language and communication that I have personally experienced in my life and as a DP student. For example, I have personally experienced how some words and ideas do not translate easily from Chinese into English. So what I love about this example here, and this is personal, and it is not required to integrate yourself or your own experiences into it. It's not required that you use your own objects, but what happens if you choose to do things that you are connected with, you, you have something else to analyze and that's how you interacted with it. So this, this is just a great example. So again, if you use a book, if you use your EE, um, if you use especially a religious text, don't talk about what the book talks about. Talk about how it communicates and how it conveys knowledge. Object number three, if you haven't noticed a pattern yet, you may not be smart enough to get an A in T. Okay, nah, I'm just kidding. Download my packet in the comment, in the description, and you will. But um, look at what the first paragraph does here because um, it's the same thing over and over again and they just nailed it. So the third object is the song Strange Fruit by Billie Holiday. Look at the first paragraph, does the exact same thing. And sure, it's not the most amazing thing, but they're doing what the Ivy wants you to do. The song Strange Fruit was sung by Billie Holiday in 1939. It is often seen to use vivid imagery to protest against the treatment of black people in America and to have a subtext about promoting civil rights. So again, again, we've got this theme that the student shows, by the way. This can be seen to be heavily insinuated throughout the song, especially with the usage of Strange Fruit, as a gruesome metaphor for the lynching of black people. So we've got the context, we've got the object, this is really good. So now the student is going to explore um, themes of meaning and race through the, the, the concepts of um, subtext and connotation that have been applied over and over again in a very effective way. Paragraph two. This song makes us think about whether there are things that only some people see or understand because of their cultural, personal experiences, etc. Don't use etc. in a paper, please. I do think that subtext and connotation, oh man, are sometimes interpreted very differently by different groups and the group that a person belongs to impacts on the meaning and on what is being communicated. For example, Strange Fruit, so now we're back on topic, was sung by Billie Holiday, a black artist. The fact that this subtext was being expressed by a black artist means that the singer was themselves a part of a group people had been marginalized a group of people have been marginalized for so long, which makes the song lyrics even more powerful and emotional. I love this idea. So so, so basically we're, we're, we're saying that because this song with this theme was being sung by someone who is African American, the, the emotion behind the song is um, intensified. And I, and I totally agree with that. So subtext and context, I'm sorry, subtext and connotation totally works here. Um, we get back on the object. I love this, this is very good. The final paragraph is gonna draw conclusions and find interpretations about knowledge. Notice again, because they're awesome, they're gonna use a phrase, something, something, this exhibition. So they're gonna say helpful to this exhibition just to show the examiner that they are following the rubric or my organizer, which is available um, for free, is, so, so that they're on topic. The use of metaphor, connotation, and subtext in this, oh, I don't wanna do that. I want my nice little yellow and this song helps the song communicate complex emotions and themes about racism and civil rights. In this way, the song is a helpful addition to this exhibition because it provides a good contrast to the dictionary. Really important, you do not have to compare or contrast at all. This paper is way too short to do that, but if you drop in these little tiny comparisons here, I think that's really good and the Ivy is gonna take note of that. It's gonna tie it all in together. Thinking of a Big Lebowski comment here, but um, it's not required at all. 
but I think that if you do it just a tiny bit there, it's gonna be good. The dictionary highlighted that subtext and connotation can sometimes, ca sometimes cause confusion because they add a layer of interpretation to the literal meanings of language. But this song shows that sometimes subtext and connotation can actually help communicate complex ideas and emotions rather than always being a challenge to the communication of knowledge. So what we've done here is um, point number two and point number three are actually disagreeing and I love that. That's like the idea of point and counterpoint. You don't have a thesis that is explaining everything. Instead, we're going in three different directions and that makes it a better, a stronger, a more complete um, exploration. Thinking about this song, I have realized that connotations and, subtext, and subtext don't always have to be challenging or misleading. If the person is trying to evoke a powerful meaning or emotion, often words that have many layered meanings deliver a more powerful impact. This response works really well because they go from literary devices to uh, the personal interpretation of the songs. While the student is too young to have a direct connotation with this, um, and I, I would assume they're not African American, um, so they're not talking about their own persecution here, they're finding a way of using the song um, in a way that creates their own experience as a feature of this response. Everything in here is insightful, analytical, and laser focused on the um, object their concepts and the IA prompt. The only thing I would change about this, if I could change anything, is just that I wouldn't include the introduction because I feel like each of the prompts could, could, could really benefit from 40 more words. But at the end of the day, it got an A, who cares? You're gonna get an A because you watch this video, so do whatever you want. So thanks for watching, I hope you had a good time. Um, I hope that TOK sucks a little bit less than when you clicked on this video. I'll see you next time, bye.